good news of Jesus Christ, not of the letter of the law, but of the Spirit. We worship and thank you this morning that as we look into your word, we ask that we might behold wondrous things from your word. And we pray that you plant these truths deep down into our hearts and help us to be doers of the word and not merely hearers of the word in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, Well, this morning we're going to talk about revival. One of my favorite subjects to talk about because it's something that we desperately need. Joel chapter 2 verse 25 is our launch pad scripture and it says, So I will restore to you the years the swarming locust has eaten. Now we could go on and read in all the other different things that it lost. One of the things about revival, you know, if we were going to ask you what is revival, probably every person here would have a little bit different, different definition of what really revival is. You know, revival isn't something for lost people. It's something for saved people. Lost people being saved is the byproduct of God's people being revived. If you're going to revive someone, Webster's Dictionary, uh, I think, defines revival as a return, a recall, or recovery to life from death or apparent death, as in revival of a drowning person. So something that's revived has to have been alive already or near death. Otherwise, you can't revive it. Lost people, those who have not called upon Christ, are spiritually dead. The Bible tells us that they're spiritually dead. They have not had the life of God in them. So they can't be revived. They have to be saved. They have to be made alive to begin with. But revival is something that we as God's people need on a regular basis. And if we don't experience revival in our own lives and in the life of the church as a whole, then the work of God will not go forth in the earth. So again, if we were going to look at what revival is, we're going to look at this a little bit this morning, but if we're going to define revival, we might have different ideas of what exactly revival is. But revival is certainly something that in this hour and every hour of the church we need. Amen. So this morning we're going to look at some different aspects of revival. In the very first scripture that we looked at this morning, just that brief statement out of Joel, if you know anything about the prophecy of Joel, the children of Israel had fallen into sin as they so often did. Throughout the Old Covenant, God's people would fall into idolatry, they'd fall into apathy, they'd fall into materialism, they'd fall into every sort of thing, just like we do in this hour, right? And as a result, God would begin to remove his grace from them, his abundance from them, his blessing from them, his protection from them. And why would God do such a thing? Well, it's because they moved. You know, judgment, the judgment of God is not necessarily God sending a tornado and blowing somebody's house down. That can be a form of judgment. But the judgment of God oftentimes is God beginning to remove his grace from us, his ability from us, his protection. And why would God do such a thing? Well, if we look at the nation of Israel as a prime example, how God dealt with them, when they would fall into sin and darkness and refuse to repent, the first thing God, of course, would do is send prophets to warn them, say, hey, wake up. You guys are in sin, you need to repent, you need to turn to the Lord. And after a long duration of time, if they wouldn't hear the prophet, they need to send another one. And after a time, what would God do? God would say to them, if you won't hear me, I'm going to turn you over to your enemies. I'm going to start removing my grace from you. Because we realize all things are from God, to God, and through God. And without God, we can do nothing. Jesus himself said, unless you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you can do nothing. So apart from the vine, we can't do a thing. And apart from the ability and grace of God in us, we are helpless and hopeless. But thank God we're not apart from that grace. And we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. But that principle does not change, even though we're New Testament believers. We don't ever get unsaved. You know, it's not like, well, okay, I'm, I'm not saved. But you can get out of fellowship with God, right? The Bible has a lot to say about abiding in the light, walking in fellowship, Abiding in the vine. Pastor Harlow is teaching a series on abiding in Christ. How many realize as a Christian you cannot abide in Christ? In other words, you can have a relation, you can be saved, but not have any relationship with God. You get to the point where you can't hear the word of God. You can't hear, you can't hear his voice. Uh, you're, you're backslidden. And so we can become dull of hearing. Uh, but what had happened to the children of Israel, they'd fall into great sin. And as a result, there was a famine in the land. And if you look at the land itself, throughout Scripture, we see that famine and pestilence and plagues and blight and all of these things are a result of spiritual sin in the land. 
What's going on in the unseen atmosphere of the heavenlies affects the natural realm that we look at. So if a nation is, effect, is affected by natural calamities, if a nation is affected by, uh, even if it's regional, a nation or an area is affected by certain things that are detrimental like uh, blight and famine and different things that kill crops, it's a result of something going on in the heavenlies that you can't see in the spiritual realm that is affecting that. It always takes place in the spiritual realm before it affects the natural realm. What shows up in the natural realm, either godly or ungodly, either a blessing or not a blessing, is normally the result of something that's already taken place in the heavenly realm that we just don't see. So if a nation is affected by, by catastrophe and so on and different things, it's often the result of sin in an area or something that God has removed his protection from that area. And you say, well, why would God do such a thing? Because God's intention is to get us to turn. And the nation of Israel would not turn. They would not repent. And so what was happening? Well, the land was being affected because of their sin. And Joel the prophet understood and drew the parallelism. He said, oh, wait, this famine that's taking place, it's so severe, and it was such a severe famine that they had a drought, and then not only did they have a drought, but they had a locust swarm, and the locust and the caterpillars and everything else came in, and they ate everything that was left from the drought. There was such a severe drought that there wasn't even enough uh, produce to have a, a sacrifice in the temple. It was a terrible time, terrible time of severe famine, and Joel is saying that this drought, this judgment is of God. This is literally, Joel said, the army of the Lord that's marching on your land and destroying the crops. And um, so Joel then brings the parallelism and he goes, okay, if we'll repent and turn back to God, he's using this as an opportunity to sh awaken the nation and say, hey, if you'll wake up and turn back to God and cry out to God and put God first in your life and make him a priority in your life and be urgent about your seeking God, God will relent and restore what has been destroyed. Because the great news about God is although throughout the scriptures, in the Old Covenant especially, God would bring judgment upon the nation of Israel because of their outright just absolute apostasy. And he'd say, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to turn you over to your enemies. I'm going to do this. I'm going to allow you to uh, reap what you're sowing. But I'm going to also restore because I'm a God of mercy. And the good news about God is God is not interested in destroying. He's interested in restoring. God wants to bless you. God wants to give you good, and do you well, and good all the days of your life. It's not God's desire that you be afflicted. It's not God's desire that you suffer, or that you suffer calamity and destruction. Now, the Bible says we'll suffer persecution, but that, it's not God's desire that, that destruction come upon you, no more than it would be God's desire, that your desire as an a, a earthly parent for destruction to come upon your own children. But oftentimes destruction or problems come into people's lives simply because they're not really walking in obedience. Remember the word says if you want to eat the good of the land you have to walk in you have to be willing and obedient. Amen? So praise God. Thank you Jesus. So revival does several things. Revival is God's people really just getting back to what we call normal Christianity. A normal relationship with God where we're walking with God daily. We're seeking the Lord. We're abstaining and staying away from the things of this world that would defile us. And when we're doing those things, we're doing what we really should be doing, which is obedience to God, then natu the natural consequences of that is God's going to bless us because God's a good God. Now, let me just draw a little parallelism here. Physical or financial or, or material blessings don't necessarily equal revival. just want you to see that. Now, God will bless us, and he will bless us as a result of revival, financially and physically, but it doesn't equal revival. And the reason I'm saying that, if you look at the book of uh, Revelation, the church at Laodicea was a very prosperous church, yet God said, you're naked, wretched, miserable, blind, and poor. And sometimes in America, we think that because we're blessed materially, that, that equals revival, or it equals the hand and blessings of God. Now, all things, God is a good God, and all good things are from God, Amen. So don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying God doesn't want to prosper you because I believe he does. But we can't look at because we're materially blessed. And say, well, I'm really, God, I'm really walking with God because I'm materially blessed. Not necessarily. You realize there are drug dealers out there that are materially blessed. Are they walking with God? No. 
So I just want you to understand that. Um, but, however, the blessings of God, including material blessings, will come upon you if you do walk with God. Didn't they come upon Abraham? Didn't they come upon David? Amen? So, again, uh, I believe because God's good God, and God wants to bless his people. God's not a stingy God. Amen? He's a good God. And not only bless you materially, but bless you in your soul, bless you emotionally, bless you, of course, spiritually is the most important thing. But if you're blessed spiritually, if you're walking in spiritual abundance, you're going to walk in emotional abundance, and uh, then other things will happen as well. God's, God's a good God. But revival is what we need as God's people when we're out of the hand of God moving. You know, if we look around our nation, it's, it's pretty easy to see that this nation has a lot of problems, right? And it's even more evident that those who profess to know Christ, now not all Christians, we, we have to be careful sometimes that we don't make blanket statements when we talk about the church and we talk about Christians, that we just assume that all Christians are backslidden and all Christians are apostate and all Christians aren't walking with God any more than we can say all Christians are walking with God and all Christians are walking in holiness and truth. But we do see in America today, in Western civilization, that there's a great deal of darkness and a great deal of false teachings and false beliefs in the church world. And it's become gross in this last hour, I mean, where you have Christians that are even denying the Lord that bought them and preaching uh, that salvation is in any name other than the name given above every name, which is Jesus, which the Bible clearly says there's salvation in no other name, for there's no other name given among men whereby we may be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. We understand foundationally that the most essential truth that we as Christians must embrace is that there is no other name, no other blood, no other salvation than what is in Jesus Christ. Paul said, I have laid a foundation, and you have to build upon it. And he said, no other foundation can anyone lay than what is laid, and that is Jesus Christ. So again, our foundation, as the old hymn goes, our faith is based on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen? That's what our faith is upon. And anyone coming preaching another gospel than that, saying that there's another way to have another than Jesus... There's some other way you can be saved other than Jesus. Well, the Bible says, let him be cursed. That's what Paul said. Even though an angel might come and say it, he said, let him be cursed. So we hold to that, and that is our foundation, and we will not relent on that. But we also realize that um, there is a lot of false teaching going on. There's a lot of darkness. There's a lot of deception. There's a lot of uh, really biblical illiteracy out here in America today, unfortunately. And things that we used to take for granted, we can't take for granted anymore. So, the church, those who profess to know Christ, we need a revival. We need to be restored. We need things that have been lost to be brought back. How many realize there's some things throughout our history as a nation that we've lost? There's some things in the church world, even though I believe we're living in an hour where greater revelation of the end times is available than ever in the history of the world. Things that men of old and angels desired to look into, we have the privilege in this hour to see because they just weren't available until this hour. However, that does not mean that we don't need the power and presence of God in our nation. I mean, if we're going to contend with the darkness of this world, if we're going to change the hearts of hardened men who are in darkness and blinded by the devil, we need a greater dimension and greater de degree of the manifest presence of God in our nation. Let me read you a few things about revival from some mighty men of God throughout the ages. Vance Havner defines revival as a work of God's spirit among his own people. What we call revival is simply New Testament Christianity the saints getting back to normal. Well, what is normal? Well, normal is the book of Acts. I believe that's normal. Now, sometimes Christians will say, well, we need to get back to the book of Acts. And by that, they mean, well, you know, they imagine that in the book of Acts, things like Peter's shadow overshadowing people, that happened every day, and the supernatural miracle of God, it was just a common thing. But you realize the book of Acts was written over a long period of time. It wasn't written in five years. It wasn't written in a couple of years. And we have to be careful that we don't look for the spectacular and miss the supernatural. 
Sometimes as Christians, we can get our eyes on things that we want spectacular miracles. But it's no more miraculous for somebody to get out of a wheelchair than it is for somebody to be saved. Right? People being saved when they're in darkness, that's a miracle. It's the power of God. They're transcending the natural course of nature. Amen? So we don't want to look for the spectacular and go, oh, we're not seeing miracles and signs and wonders, so we're not having the supernatural. No, our lives are supernatural because we're born of God and as beings who are born of God, children of the Most High God, children of light, we are supernatural because we supersede the natural course of this world. We're walking above, or at least we're supposed to be walking above the darkness of this age, which is supernatural. Amen? How many of you could overcome sin before you were saved? No, because you were naturally minded. You were carnally minded. But now because of the Spirit of God living within us, we have the mind of Christ, which means we can walk in the supernatural power of God. Amen. Which means you have the power to overcome sin, which is supernatural. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. A.W. Tozer, the phenomenal writer, wrote, Revival is essentially a manifestation of God. Now, I love that. Revival is essentially a manifestation of God. Now, how many realize God is always in all places at all times? Do we realize that? Psalm 136, I think it is. This is, where can I go from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths below, even there, the darkness is like light to you. So God is in all places at all times. He sees everything. All things are naked and open before him with whom we have to deal. But how many realize that even though the presence of God is in all places at all times, we don't always recognize the presence of God at all times. Right? Do you understand that? There's times in the Old Covenant where an angel would appear or look like a person, and people would talk with this person thinking it was just somebody, and then the angel just went up into heaven. And they go, oh my gosh, we saw God, and we didn't even know he was here. There's times in people's lives where the presence of God can be there, but you're spiritually dull and you don't recognize this presence of God is there. I mean, Jesus, the living word of God, the one who created the universe, came and lived among the Jewish people in the New Testament. He spoke to the leaders of Israel, and he said, you people are dull of hearing. You can't even hear. You know, you talk about Abraham, but said one greater than Abraham is here. Abraham saw my day and rejoiced, but he was saying to these people, the leaders of that time, he said, you're so dull of hearing, you don't even recognize the truth when it shows up in the flesh. Basically what he's saying. Now, we can be the same way. We can become dull of hearing. We can be dull of our spiritual senses. We can go about our merry way and ignore God. You know, God rebuked the children of Israel one time for ignoring him. He said, will a, bride, will a bridegroom ignore his bride? But my children have, Israel has ignored me day after day after day. How many realize you can ignore God? Amen? Amen. Well, A.W. Tozer said, revival is essentially a manifestation of God. What do you mean? God showing up. How many want God to show up? I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to just come to church. I don't want to just have a relationship with God, and there's no evidence of God. Well, we walk by faith. Of course we walk by faith. Do you? But do you honestly believe that God doesn't want to show himself to you? This is not an intellectual Christianity we're talking about. It's an experiential Christianity we're talking about. And I know there's people who say, well, we don't need to experience God. Sure you need to experience God. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's what revival is about. When revival takes place, people start to experience the presence of God. They go, God is awesome. Why do you think people do drugs? Why do you think people seek the occult? Why do you think there's so much supernaturalism that people are into nowadays? I mean, look at movie after movie after movie. They all have supernatural themes, extraterrestrial themes, something beyond the natural realm. Why? Because God designed people to want supernatural things. It's built in your DNA. We just heard the scripture out of Ezekiel, or I mean out of Ecclesiastes, that God put eternity in our hearts. And if you don't seek the living God, you're going to seek something. People want reality. People want to experience God. And they're looking for God. They're just looking in all the wrong places. And I'm going to tell you, the occult has nothing on God. I mean, for crying out loud, should people seek to the occult and have experiences and seek to God and have nothing? Of course not. God desires to show himself to his people. 
God desires that you have experiences with him. That doesn't mean you're going to have some out-of-body experience and go to another planet or something like that. What does it mean? It means he wants you to experience his love and know that his love. I mean, there's many times in my life as a Christian that I've experienced the supernatural presence of God. I mean, the presence of God in a tangible manner where you come out of that place and you're more in love with God than you've ever been in your life. This is one of the things, revival, the byproduct of revival. When, when revival takes place and manifestations of God take place, where God begins to show up in might and in power, and the very atmosphere becomes charged with the very presence of God, people will shut down everything in their life to seek God. During the great Welsh revivals, the presence of God was so powerful during the Welsh revivals, and there were three Welsh revivals, but during the, the late 1800s, the Re Welsh revivals, the power of God was so powerful and transformed that nation so dramatically that they had to shut down all the courts because there was no criminals to try. Now, brother, that's transformation. The power of God was so transforming that all the saloons went out of business and they turned them into churches and places to worship God. Now that's not ordinary. The, when the presence of God, one of the things, uh, they, they talk about the, the revival in the Herbenes, that if you walked anywhere, everywhere you went, if you went anywhere, people were talking about God. Now wouldn't it be awesome in the United States of America if you go to the bank and people are talking about God? You go anywhere and God is on the tongue of every person. That is what happens when revival takes place. That is what happens when hearts are melted and transformed and the power of God and the tangible presence of God begins to saturate and permeate the very atmosphere. And that's what we need, church. That's what brings transformation. George Otis in his wonderful studies and research about revivals that are taking place around the world, I mean, time after time. I mean, literally, there are thousands of revivals that have been documented in South America and Africa and even some places in the United States and cities where people cried out to God. And the transforming power of God came into a community. And from what that community used to be like compared to what it is today, it is a transformation. Now, does that mean that everything in that community and every person saved and everybody's walking with God, there's no sin? No, that's not what he's talking about. But there is definitely a change that has taken place in the town or the country or the community that was wasn't there before. How many know that that's what America needs? How many realize America has had revivals in the past? During times of great darkness, you and I would not be here today except for the revivals of God that hit this nation. The entire eastern seaboard at one time in America was ablaze with the presence and power of God as a result of two businessmen meeting in New York City and having a prayer meeting. First day, I think 15 people showed up. Within a few months, hundreds of people would take off work and go pray. It was a revival of prayer, moved by the power and presence of God, and people would be saved. People would go into communities. Certain two towns were ablaze with the presence of God, where people would go into the town, and the very atmosphere was charged with the presence of God. Now, that's revival. That's transformation. That's the power of God. One of the things we prayed over the years over this church, we said, Lord, we pray that the very atmosphere, that when people come by this place, that the presence of God arrests people, that they're drawn by the presence of God. I mean, I've heard of numerous revivals where God has shown up in power, where people have been driving down the road with their car, minding their own business, they don't know God, and suddenly the power of God comes upon them, and they stop their car and run out of the car to the church to get saved. I've heard of revivals and read of revi revivals where people came, this one particular revival where a guy came to get his wife. She was at this church and a revival was breaking up and he was a hardened, hardened sinner. He was abusive to his wife and an alcoholic. He comes to the door, he opens the door and the power of God hits him so strongly that he runs and slides to the altar in weeping repentance and gets saved. Now that's the kind of power we need, folks. Some of the revivals I've read about in past times in America, I remember this one particular revival that happened in the East Coast. Um, this young boy witnessed this. He recorded it, talked about it. It was like a 10-year-old boy, and he witnessed this man who was a lawyer in the town, a high, you know, intellectual man, well-known in the town. The man got up on the pew and started screaming at the top of his lung, Hell is opening, and I'm falling into it. 
and cried out for salvation. I tell you, I don't care how much of a professing atheist you are. I don't care how hard you are to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you see hell opening in your body, your soul falling into it, you're going to repent. That's what we need, folks. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about revival. Extraordinary times. He said revival is the manifestation of God. It has the stamp of deity on it, which even the unregenerate and the uninitiated are quick to recognize. Revival must of necessity make an impact on the community, and this is one means by which we may distinguish it from a more usual operation of the Holy Spirit. See, what we really want, what, we, what I believe America needs and what our nation needs and this area needs is we need the presence and power of God to impact our area. Now, this church, we have prayed since 19, the mid-90s um, because God put in our heart to impact a four-county area. Initially, the vision was to reach out to a 50-mile radius and throughout the time I've been here, we have had numerous people have visions, not only in this church, but in other churches, and because I don't believe it's just about this church, and I want to make it clear, we're not some special group of people, we're God's people. All God's people are special. And God has no favorites, because everybody's his favorite. You could say, I'm the favorite of God. But then again, the neighbor, your neighbor's the favorite of God, too. Faith pleases God Unbelief doesn't please God, right? But we've had numerous people throughout the ages have visions of a hub, uh, like a, a wheel with, with a hub and then spokes and the presence and power of God reaching out. And, and we've not seen the fulfillment of that, but we've seen re, rejuver, rejuverances of that. We've seen it time and time again. As a matter of fact, the first person in our church that ever had that was, was uh it's Janet Miller. I remember years ago at a prayer meeting. Remember, Mom, when she had that, that vision of that she, uh, 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 hub? And she said, well, I see this hub. I see spokes going out there and people reaching out. Because that's what God has called us to do. I believe northern Wisconsin will experience a revival. Do you know that Wisconsin is the only, the only state in the entire Midwest that has never in its history had a major revival? The only one. Minnesota has had revivals. Michigan has had revivals. Illinois has had revivals. You ever hear of Zion, Illinois? Anybody hear of Zion, Illinois? Well, Zion, Illinois was started as a result of healing revival. What was the name of the guy? I can't think of his name. Dowie. John Alexander Dowie. Now, Dowie, in the latter part of his life, got into error Unfortunately, he got into some strange doctrine and was actually disbanded from his church. But that doesn't make what he did ungodly. I mean, it was out of that healing revival where Dowie came to America. He was arrested a hundred times for preach, healing, uh, practicing medicine without a license. But there's such miracles through Dowie's life. He had the gift of working of miracles and healings in his life. Amazing miracles. People would come in wheelchairs and crutches. As a matter of fact, in the early parts of Dowie's ministry, when the healing revival was breaking out in Chicago, um, they lined his church with crutches and wheelchairs and stuff. They were all over the walls. People would come from all over the world to be healed. And it was out of that meetings, out of his church, that ministries like Catherine Kuhlman were born and healing ministries. It was a supernatural time. During the early part of American, during the 19, 1800s and the, clear up into the 1950s, there was a healing revival in America. Out of the healing revival came the voice of healing. And uh, there were people being healed all over America. It was easy to get people healed. And people had prayed for many generations for healing. That God would supernaturally pour out his spirit in healing power. You say, well, why aren't we seeing that today? Because people trust the arm of the flesh today. Because people have a prevailing spirit oftentimes of unbelief. God still heals today. I don't think God heals today. I don't think God... The hardest thing with people is to get them convinced that God does anything today. Because it doesn't compute with their little carnal mind. Well, I, uh, I don't know about all that stuff. Well, if you have that attitude, God will not visit you. Because you don't trust him. Well, I'm afraid he might, I might get deceived. You'll be the first one to be deceived. You're in deception already, because fear is deception. If God has it, I want it. 
How many of you, if your son asks uh, ask you for a loaf of bread, are you going to give him a stone or a serpent? If you seek God in revival, the devil going to show up? Well, he could. No, he can't because my God is greater than the devil. And I trust my God. And you and I should have enough savvy to discern what's of the devil and what's of God. Amen? I don't know if I'm the only one hearing this, but this morning I think you guys are getting a hold of this. But we need a revival. Amen. Amen. Charles Finney, the great American, one of the greatest uh, revivalists of, of uh, American history, said, revival is the renewal of the first love of Christians. That's basically what it is. Remember what God said to the church at Ephesus? He said, you know, basically, you like the word. You're dogmatic about truth. You stand for truth. You've hated those who are of the synagogue of Satan. You've hated those who are liars. You've exposed them for being liars. But this is the problem. You don't really love me the way you used to love me. You've lost your passion for me. You don't have a passion for me. If we could define the church in America, the church in America could be probably defined in two different churches. The church of Laodicea, the materialistic, self-serving church, or the church at Ephesus, the church that has lost its first love. It doesn't have the passion for God that it used to have. Now, I don't know about you. There are certain places, and there are churches where people are passionately involved. But when I was a young Christian in the 1980s, I got saved in 1982, and there was a greater evidence of passion for God than there is in America right now. People just love to go to Bible studies. They love to study the Word. There was a move of God during that time uh, that that began to usher people. Uh, People began to leave uh, dead denominational churches. This is where the charismatic renewal came from. Why? Because people were tired of dead church, and they wanted something that was alive. And they began to leave those churches by the drove, and that's where charismatic churches like ours came from. And it wasn't that people didn't love God. It was just that those churches had left God for the most part. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And, And unfortunately, a lot of those denominational churches, a lot of them are dying. Now, the problem with Christians is when you're into something new, it's exciting and new and thrilling. But what's happened over the years? Well, in charisma church, charismatic churches, people have kind of come, become humdrum about things of God. Well, yeah, we know about miracles, and we know about speaking in tongues, and we know all those things. Oh, I got anything new. Because people are carnal. They're naturally carnal. I mean, you don't have to work at being carnal. You just are. No, I'm not carnal. Sure you're carnal. The flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Every day when you get up, you've got a battle going on. Your carnal appetites against God's desire for you to follow him. And what did Jesus say? If you want to be my disciple, you have to pick up your cross every day. Nail your flesh. Nail your desires to the cross. That's painful. Everything Jesus said, that's, that hurts. Getting nailed to a cross is not something to go, whoa, I get to get nailed to a cross today. You know, what if physically that happened every day? Not something that's appealing to flesh. What's crosses for? Crosses are for your carnal desires to die on. Paul said, I die daily. (laughs) He must increase, I must decrease. So that's what brings about revival. That's the language of revival. More of God, less of me. His will, not my will. That is the language revival. When I was a young Christian, and we're going to go into this next month, Lord, when I was a young Christian, there were a lot of holiness preachers around. There were a lot of holiness preachers in the Word of Faith camp. And they preached holiness. And get the sin out of your life and repent and turn from darkness, turn to light. You don't hear very many holiness preachers, do you, anymore? Holiness is not a popular topic in America anymore. Because it requires your flesh being crucified on the tree. And that's not real popular about, you know, a materialistic, narcissistic society. That it's all about me and easy Christianity. Well, if you want easy Christianity, you've got Christianity without Christ. Because Jesus never said, follow me and it'll be easy. It's going to cost you something. Oh, I wish preachers would give altar calls like that nowadays. That's the altar calls we need. If you want to follow Jesus, get a backbone. And if you don't, hit the door. 
Don't waste our time. I've spent many years chasing people around, trying to get them to live for God. You know what? Go live for the devil. I'd rather have people go and live for the devil than waste my time trying to get them to live for God. At least then I know what camp you're in. We don't want tares among the wheat. And when revival hits, the tares get fired. They catch on fire and they (laughs) either get in or get out. You're pretty hard there, preacher. This is just basic Christianity I'm preaching, folks. John the Baptist came preaching a gospel of repentance. And what did he say to the children of Israel? He said the same thing. Behold, his winnowing fork is in his hand. And he's going to gather his own into his barn. And the outsiders, those who are not of his own, the chaff, he's going to burn with unquenchable heat. He's going to torch them. Amen? Because what is revival about? What brings about revival? What is the What is the qualification or what is the condition we have to meet for God to show up? We have to be clean. We have to be pure. We have to have God as our Lord. What does that mean? Supreme Master. He tells us what to do, where to do it, and how to do it. He has complete and utter control of our lives. If if Christ said tomorrow, quit your job and go do this, you go, oh, sure, I don't know how you're going to support me, but I'll do it. Yeah, let's go do it. Not that he's necessarily going to do that, but he wants you to be willing to do that, right? If the Lord said, tomorrow I want you to sell everything and go to Afghanistan and win people to Christ, and by the way, when you get there, you're going to win five people and then you're going to be martyred. You go, oh, that doesn't sound like much fun, but I'll do it anyhow, right? That's the kind of radical, that's radical Christianity. That's real Christianity. That's the kind of Christ-centered life that God says, you know what? I am not afraid to give you anything and everything because I can trust you with it. Whoo, glory to God. That sounds much better than the seeker-sensitive churches today that are so man-centered, they have, no, uh, they have no understanding of God and his power. Well, where did I leave off? I was talking about Revi- Finney and his revival. Um, oh, yeah, let's go back and read this because I think I got lost. Surprising. Uh, <laughs> Men are so spiritually sluggish. Oh, this is what he said. It is the renewal of the first love of Christians resulting in the awakening and conversion of sinners to God. So again, sinners being saved as a result of us loving God. The more in love with you are with God, the less you really give a rip about what other people think about you. The reason we have not enough God in our, our lives and our churches is because we're so concerned about the opinions of human beings. You know, when I was a young Christian, I remember I used to put bumper stickers all over my car. I mean, it was kind of nuts. And I'm not saying just be bizarre. But I, I was just overtly making sure that you knew that I love God. <laughs> of course, people ran by the droves. I mean, it's like water to rats. I mean, they just flush them out. They run. Um, you know, and I'm not saying everything I did was wise. It was kind of foolish, some of the stuff I did. But I would just determine to serve God. I love God and wanted to serve God. Amen? as a young Christian. It it presupposes that the church is sunk down in a backslidden state, and a revival consists in the return of the church from her backslidings and in the conversion of sinners. A revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. Isn't that good? It's just like, okay, hey, you know what? I think I'll start obeying God again. What a novel thought. (laughs) Right? Right? This is what Finney goes on and says, men are so spiritually sluggish. I love that. Not that they're sluggish, but the way he put it. Men are so spiritually sluggish. They're like spiritual warthogs. Men are so spiritually sluggish, there are so many things to lead their minds off from religion and to oppose the influences of the gospel that it is necessary to raise an excitement among them till the tide rises so high as high as to sweep away the opposing obstacles. They must be so excited that they will break over the, contra, uh, the counteracting, counteracting influences before they will obey God. In other words, have you ever tried to share Christ with people and it's just like talking to a slug? I mean, really, this is the... And you can, you're talking to them, you're preaching the gospel to them, tell them about Christ, and you can just see the, 
there's, it's nothing there. You might as well go out and talk to the slug in the garden. That's about how receptive they are to the gospel. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, you know, you just look at their eyes as like, you know, it's like you're talking to a wall. Because, you know, that's what we're talking about. Something to char them like, oh my gosh, I'm dying and going to hell. Right? Look at this. A revival breaks the power of the world and of sin over Christians. It brings them to such vantage ground that they get a fresh impulse toward heaven. They have a new foretaste of heaven and a new desires after union with God and the charm of the world is broken and the power of sin overcome. The whole drift of revival and everything about it is designed to present the truth to your mind for your obedience or resistance. What does that mean? Well, what is God doing with people all the time? God is constantly in the process of bringing people to the point of making a decision. Ah, uh, paper or plastic. Heaven or hell. Right? But most of the time, men's minds are so preoccupied with the things of this world that they can't even hear the voice of God saying, if you die today, hell will be your destiny. Oh, for crying out loud, we don't even use that word in the church today. Unless some Christian gets mad and comes out of their mouth. You don't hear it from the podiums. Oh, oh, he said the H word in church. Uh, hell, what's, what's that? Oh, you know that's separation from God? Thank God for Ray Comfort. Because Ray Comfort really blew the lid off that garbage. You know, as far as the sinner's concerned, being separated from God isn't really a bad thing. If I'm in sin, I want to get as far away from God as I can. In case you didn't recognize it, sinners don't go, Wow, you're having a revival and God showing up? I want to come. Sinners are looking for God like a thief is looking for a policeman. They're not looking for God. They're running from God. That's why they're indulging their carnal appetites. That's why they're drunk all the time. They're stoned all the time. They're involved in every ungodly thing so they don't have to think about God. That's what the world does. It feeds you all this crap so you don't think about God. God? God is far from my thoughts. There is a God... There's no God. We just die and we're like slugs in the ground. We're like the dog and dirt. Well, if I'm a lost person, that's what the devil wants me to believe because then there's no fear of death and dying and no fear of hell and eternity. We want sinners to realize that hell is hot and heaven is high because we don't want them to go there. We don't want to preach separation from God. If you die, you're going to go to hell. And it's not pleasant. And it's not a highway. Well, it is a highway. And your friends aren't going to be there partying. You're going to be weeping and wailing, and there'll be gnashing of teeth. And it's where the worm does not die. And everything about it, and anything that Jesus and the New Covenant talks about hell, it is not a pleasant place that anyone would want to go there. That's what we want people to know. Well, I don't know how a loving God could send anybody to hell. A loving God died on the cross, sent Christ to die for people, so you don't have to go there. But if you choose to reject the truth, that is where you will end up. Well, I just can't accept it. That's just too bad. That's the choice. Well, you know, I don't... I heard this guy preaching about a kinder, gentler hell on the radio. Why would I want to impress upon a lost person that there's a kinder, gentler version of eternity without Christ? I want them to be so scared of dying and going to hell that they will do anything in their power to get out of it. <laughs> Glory to God. Did I say that? I just said that, didn't I? Yes, I did. Psalm 85, verse... 
6 or 7, Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. What is that? That's a prayer to the believer. Will you not revive us, O Lord, that your people may rejoice in you? See, rejoicing in God, glorying in God, that's the byproduct of revival. When you're revived, you're like, Glory to God, life is good. God is a good God. There's a joy in your heart. There's a rejoicing in your heart. You know, when I first got saved, and I've had this experience numerous times in my life, but, um, you know, when I got saved, the day after I got saved, I woke up in the morning the next day, and I knew that heaven was my home, and I had a smile on my face. Like, glory to God. Heaven is where I'm going when I die. I had a peace with God, and the result of that peace with God brought instant gratification and joy into my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Down in my heart. I've got the peace that passes understanding down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my H-E-A-R-T. For those of you who have never sung that little kid song, that's a great song. Listen to this. We're going to wrap it up with this this morning. This is uh, from the book um, Rent Heavens by R.B. Jones. Uh, speaking about the Welsh revival that took place, one of the Welsh revivals of 1904. And this is what he says, The success of the gospel in the case of the unsaved is conditioned by its success, first of all, in the case of the saved. Who's that? That's us, right? God reaches those without through those within. Mr. Evan Roberts saw this clearly and never tired emphasizing of it. Do you know that Evan Roberts, who was a young man, and through a group of young people prayed revival into Wales. And this was one of their prayers. They said, Lord, shut hell for one year. That was what they prayed. Lord, close hell over Wales for one year. And you know what they were meaning. Don't let people die and go to hell. And he said this. He said, "Um, God reaches those without through those within. And it says... This is what Evan Roberts said. My mission, he used to say, is first to the churches. When the churches are aroused to their duty, men of the world will be swept into the kingdom. A whole church on its knees is irresistible. See, Christ is appealing. Even when Jesus walked the earth, um, hardened sinners were attracted to him. Now, Religion is not appealing. Man-made religion is not appealing. But the presence of God is appealing. Now, that may sound like a contradiction because I say, well, the sinner is running from Christ. Well, they are running from Christ. But when the presence and power of God shows up in extraordinary, unusual manners or beyond the norm, what we call normal, that presence has a natural drawing. Remember, God said, no one can come, Christ said, no one can come to me unless the Holy Spirit draws him. Well, during times of revival, there's a supernatural, an advance, there's a, a greater degree of the presence of God which draws men. So those people you're talking to, like a slug, suddenly there's an awakening in them because the presence of God takes hold of them and begins to break down the darkness that blinds their minds so you don't have that spiritual interference anymore. Their minds aren't clouded. Paul said, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. That's our, ju- that's our job. Amen? And he goes on, he says here, um, to the same effect are the words of the leader of the revival in Wales in 1859 when the bonds of Paul and Silas in the Philippian, Philippi prison snapped, the bonds of the prisoner snapped. You know one of the problems with, with the world around us is the Christians are so bound up they can't unbind anyone else. You go into a Christian bookstore today and you see book after book after book and no slam against them. I go into Christian bookstores, but what do we see by authors in Christendom today? How to get free from this, how to do this, how to get over this, how to get free, how to, how to blah, 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 blah. It's all about the church getting free because the church isn't free. We're like Lazarus where we've been raised from the dead, but we're bound in grave clothes. And those grave clothes represent the things oftentimes of our carnal appetites and nature that is still holding us in bondage. We put our hands to the plow and we're still looking back at the darkness of this world. And as a result of it, the church is bound in darkness when we should be walking in the light. 
So revival breaks those things off of people's minds. This is why, you know, you can pray for people till you rub the hair off their heads sometime, but until the power and presence of God shows up supernaturally and abundantly, you'll not get them free. But when revival takes place and the supernatural presence of God begins to fill the very atmosphere, healings will take place, miracles will take place. People who are bound by, by drugs and alcohol and bound by every sort of sinful thing, suddenly those things will just be broken off of them. It's just like, man, that's awesome. Glory to God. Why? Because when God shows up in power, things happen. Woo! That makes me want to shout. I don't know about you, but it makes me want to shout. So when the church is freed from the bonds of apathy and worldliness, those who are being drawn by Satan to eternal death will be released also. If the revival of 1904 had anything that might be called a slogan, it was this, bend the church and save the people. What does that mean? Well, think of a reed being bent or a tree, like a, like a, a um, palm tree that bends. You know, palm trees, they can bend them right down to the ground with the wind. They'll get in a hurricane, they'll flatten them right down to the ground, and then they'll come right back up after the storm. They have so much water in them. What's he talking about? When the church, when we as God's people are bent low and bent to the word and will of God, when God doesn't have to fight against our will and go, oh, would you please obey me? And we go, ah, I know I should, but I don't want to do that. Right? The church is just like, Bend me, O Lord. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Yes, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it, and I'll gladly do it, and I'll do it right now. So when the church is bent to the will of God, then as a result, lost people come into the kingdom. It is a most solemn reflection, even a terrifying truth, that when God's people fail to respond to the message God had sent them, their very failure deprives lost sinners of the power to respond to God's message to them. So why aren't lost people being saved? Well, in case you didn't look around you, there aren't a whole lot of Christians out sharing the gospel. How many of you, in the time you've been a Christian, have had a Christian come to your door and share Christ with you? I've had a lot of Jehovah Witnesses. I've had one, maybe one Christian in my whole lifetime since I've been a Christian come to my door and try to share Christ with me. I've had numerous Jehovah Witnesses. I've had Mormons come to my door. Where, is, where are Christians? Well, it's not very effective going to people's doors and sharing the gospel with them. You know, there's st- who cares? They don't have the Holy Ghost. You do. And you can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. Well, I would feel uncomfortable. Good. That's great. The best thing you could do is feel uncomfortable because comfort is the enemy of God's will. If you're going to follow God, God's going to lead you right into the lion's den of uncomfort. Daniel was serving God. He ended up facing death. I don't think Daniel was really comfortable. Like, yeah, I'm going to the lion's den. Glory to God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were like, hallelujah, we get to be thrown into a fire furnace. They said, you know, God's able to deliver us, and if he doesn't, we're just going to be toast and go on to the house. wasn't comfortable. It's never comfortable to serve God, but it brings God in the scene. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. That's a whole message of itself, but we don't have time to preach that this morning. Let's get through this chapter, and then we're going to wrap it up here this morning. So in other words, our disobedience to God keeps lost people from coming into the kingdom of God. That's sobering, isn't it? A dead church is the most effective obstacle the enemy can devise in the way of sinners coming to Christ. Wow. Wow. What do we hear in America constantly? I'm so sick of hearing this, I could puke. I see blog after blog on leadership things by pastors written, why are people leaving the church? What do we need to do to get self-absorbed, narcissistic, carnal, sinful people to stay in our churches? Kick them in the seat of the pants and preach the gospel like I'm preaching it right now. For crying out loud. Who'd want to go to war with people like that? Well, you know, I'll be there until the bullets start flying and I'm out of here. I actually saw one guy, one pastor write that the gospel message is not appealing to the uh, millennial generation. So we need to repackage it. Hogwash. 
The gospel is salvation through Christ and repentance from sin. And loss, whether you're a millennial, whether you're a Generation X, whether you're a baby boomer, whether you're whatever, you need to repent and be saved through the cross of Christ. We don't need, like, you know, the easiest means to salvation message. We've had 30 years of that nonsense, and that's why we're in the trouble we're in. So afraid of offending everybody. Oh my gosh, he might say something that would cause somebody to run from the gospel and lost and they die and go to hell. I wouldn't want to offend everyone. I don't know about you, but Jesus offended a bunch of people and he did it on purpose. So you're in good company. So if you think I offend people, it's like, I'm with Jesus, hallelujah. There's one point Jesus has this massive amount of people following him. He goes, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part with me. And he doesn't say it to a bunch of millennials. He says it to Jews. Jews who've been taught all their life, if you drink blood, it's a sinful thing. You don't eat flesh, that's cannibalism. And he says something in such a way, and the cool thing about Jesus is he doesn't explain it. Let me explain this strange doctrine. I mean, the Catholics are still struggling with it, for crying out loud. We're eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Transubstantiationism. They're still into that. You think Jesus over all these years would come and say, ah, uh, I wasn't really talking about literally eating my flesh and drink my blood. <laughs> oh, yes, he was. He was really talking about literally. And he says this to a bunch of Jews, and they'll go, oh, he couldn't be the Messiah. <laughs> Messiah doesn't say eat flesh and drink blood. We're getting out of here, Martha. We're in a cult. I told you this is a cult. We're leaving. And all the people leave. They just, one by one, they pack their bags and leave. And Jesus is standing there and he goes to his disciples, you going to leave too? <laughs> they go, where are we going to go? <laughs> we done left everything to follow you, Jesus. And you're the only one that's got the words of life. Good boys. Let's go. Maybe that's what we need in the church today. Preach a little hellfire and brimstone, little things that make people uncomfortable so they go, oh, I'm offended and I'm leaving. Good. I don't have to deal with you anymore. <laughs> I'm going to the church that doesn't offend anyone. Well, we'll see in hell. You know? Why don't they just say to the church of everybody go to hell? That wouldn't be very appealing to people, though, would it? I mean, you know, I'm not trying to really be, I am being facetious, I know, but, you know. All right, let's wrap this up. I've said that four times. You do know that the words, you know, if you're, you might be a preacher if the words and in conclusion mean absolutely nothing to you. So, uh, anyhow, we are going to wrap it up here, though, because we got to stop. Amen. Praise God. So a dead church is the greatest obstacle to believers or lost people coming. The circular issue of the Free Church Council of uh, Camarthian about the time of the great outburst in 1904 stresses this very point. It says, We cannot justly expect sinners to be saved in our places of worship to be filled by those from the outside until we ourselves get right with God. And this can only be done by an absolute surrender of our whole lives to Jesus Christ as King and of faith, acceptance of the Holy Spirit. Thus, whosoever prays for revival, let him be sure that when it comes, God will concentrate upon his own people. This is the lesson taught not only by the revival of 1904, but by all revivals. It is a lesson also which needs not only to be uh, not only the vision, but also the courage of faith to act upon. Certainly, go after the lost, but concentrate upon God's people. The key to the whole evangelistic position is there. An awakened church creates the atmosphere in which decision by the lost to accept the Savior will be made easier. The holiness movement, as the late Dr. R. W. Dale truly said, is the hope of the church. It is more. It is the hope also of the world. Amen. Pastor Harley, you want to come and close this service for us this morning? Glory to God and lead people in prayer. Amen. Thank you, brother.
Pastor, you have stirred.